It was a Wednesday morning when I received the letter. As I was taking a sip of my coffee before work, I immediately froze. It had been over 10 years since I received any communication from my parents. I was all grown up now and hadn't thought about mother and father for years. I embraced the fear and opened the letter. My heart stopped. The twisted pair was being released from prison next week and let back out into society. I began thinking about the day I decided to run away from home. I had drafted the perfect plan in my diary. It had taken me about a year to perfect every angle. It was risky, but I was finally ready. On Sunday evening, when I knew my parents were asleep and the maids would be gossiping down in the kitchen, I grabbed my duffel bag out of the cupboard. I had everything I needed for my journey into the outside world. In my head, I had imagined escaping to be so difficult, but it was a piece of cake. I simply walked down the spiral staircase and out of the door into my oh-so-perfect suburban town. It must have looked strange, such a young girl walking around by herself. But everyone in this town is so self-obsessed. I'm not surprised they didn't notice me. The only thing they turned their head for is money. The longer I walked, the smaller the houses got until I was no longer surrounded by the mansions, and it didn't smell like freshly trimmed gardens. It was late night by this time, and the houses were gray and dreary. I was scared, but exhilarated. I clutched at the envelope in my hand that was going to allow me to start my new life as an ordinary person. You see, a few days after my birthday last year, I had overheard mother and father talking. What they had thought was a discreet conversation actually informed me that they are not my real parents. This is how my great escape started to form. After doing a lot of snooping around and investigating when my parents were out playing golf or drinking champagne, I was able to get my real parents' details. The night I found out, I felt so relieved. I had always known that I was an outsider in my picturesque life. I craved a reality that included TV dinners, baseball games after school, and a cozy family home where you didn't have to use the intercom to ask for a glass of water. I never felt a connection to my parents. We spent hardly any time together, and I was basically raised by several underpaid maids. Anyway, after what felt like hours of walking, several buses, and more than a few strange looks, I had finally arrived at the address scrawled on a piece of paper in the envelope. I was ready to meet my real parents. As I knocked on the door, I immediately felt uneasy as I heard several dogs rapidly barking in the back garden. There were all kinds of noises and smells coming from the house that were new to me, and they set me on edge. Finally, after a lot of huffing and puffing whilst turning several locks on the door, a very annoyed looking lady with uncombed hair opened the door. What do you want? She asked. I was lost for words but finally managed to mutter my name and whisper, I think you are my real mom. Her expression softened for just a second before she barked at me. I don't have any children and went to slam the door. I was unsure of what to do and was just about to turn and leave when a messy looking man opened the door. He told me that I had better come in and led me through a gray hallway into a messy living room. On one of the tattered sofas sat the lady with her head in her hands. As I was led to be seated, the man asked several questions in order to check my identity. When he was sure of who I was, he asked why I was there. I explained my feelings of always being an outsider and how I had always known that I didn't belong with mother and father. I want to live a normal person's life with you, my real family, I moaned. The lady shook her head and looked at the man who was supposedly my birth father. They asked to be excused for a minute and went off into another room to talk. Upon re-entering the room, they told me that they had come to a decision that I could stay. If I really wanted to experience how normal people lived, they would give me three days with them and see how I felt by the end of it. I was ecstatic. They, however, looked doubtful. It was really late and they told me it was time for bed. I agreed and gathered my things ready to go upstairs and see my new cozy bedroom. However, they asked me to stand up and started to place a sheet on the tattered two-person sofa behind me. Turns out that when you live a normal lifestyle, you don't have endless amounts of rooms for guests to pick and choose from. Still, undeterred, I was ready to make this work. After all, perhaps we could negotiate the rooming situation at another time. Come morning, I was starving and ready for my usual breakfast buffet of fruit, pastries, and juices. I walked around the house looking for the person responsible for feeding me, but could not find anyone. Then I saw a note. We both had to leave for work. There is bread on the side and some butter in the fridge. Help yourself. I was shocked at the prospect of making my own meal. And even more so, that my supposed parents could leave me alone all day. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea? I had to try and make it work though, and I determinately grabbed the bread and spread it with butter. By lunchtime, my real parents were still out, and I was really starting to miss my luxurious lifestyle. Maybe it wasn't so bad with mother and father. 
I just sometimes wished we could do the things I saw other families do on television. Yet, I had gotten myself in a mess and didn't know how to get out of it. I was going to have to be tough and survive the three days. Finally, when it was dark, my birth parents returned. They apologized for being out all day, but explained that it was the only way they could survive. They had to make money. The woman was being a lot softer with me now, and had bought all of the ingredients to make a big hearty meal. She suggested we cook as a family, and boy was I excited! Before we started cooking, however, they wanted to explain something to me. They revealed how they had been worried about sharing it last night in case I didn't believe them, but that now was the right time. My birth mother began. I think I know why you have never felt at home with your mother and father. You have come all of this way to escape, so I think you are old enough and responsible enough to know your history. When you were very young, you inherited billions of pounds from me. This is money that I received from my father when he died, but put in your name. I don't want to shock you, but the woman that you call mother is actually my sister. She was so bitter and jealous that father left me the money, she decided to forge documents and put the money in her name until you reached the age of 18. She knew this left me without anything and no proper tools to care for you, my daughter. She then did the unthinkable and took me to court over you. She built a strong case that you would be better off with her and the money, and she won. You are so young, which is why you probably don't remember. But the fortune is in fact yours, not your mother and father's. When all of the fighting in court was over, I was in so much pain that I couldn't bear to see you. This is why we stayed out of your life, but I hope so much that you can forgive us. Both of my real parents had tears in their eyes. I could not believe what they were saying. Then I shocked myself as I said out of nowhere, I think I know where we can get the proof we need to fix this. My real mom and dad looked surprised, but allowed me to continue. I explained how the night I had heard them talking in the study, I also found documents proving they were not my real parents. If we could get to that, we could get back the money and put an end to all of this madness. That night, we sat up late and devised a plan. I would return home and apologize for ever running away. As this created a distraction, my birth parents would sneak into the study using the map I had meticulously drawn for them. They would snatch the documents and go straight to the police without mother and father expecting a thing. Well, that was the plan anyway. As I walked up the familiar drive, lined with marble statues and fountains, I felt a sense of dread. I tried to shake it off. I knocked on the door and was greeted by Giles, our butler. He called for mother and father, and they came running down the stairs and swooped me into their arms. It was showtime. As I sat down in the living room to discuss what had happened, there was a loud crash from across the hall. Darn it! Mother and father went running into the study where he caught my birth parents red-handed trying to take the papers. Enraged, they called Giles and our security guards to take my parents away. It all happened so fast and there was so much shouting. I fainted. The next thing I remember was being in the hospital with mother and father by my side. I drifted in and out of conversation and could hear the police officer announcing that my birth parents were missing. My mouth went dry, and I couldn't speak. I tried to scream that they had been kidnapped and were in danger, but I couldn't. I knew all hope had been lost. As the years went by and I grew up, there was one thing that kept me going. On my 18th birthday, I would legally inherit all of the money. I knew that the first thing I would do would be to cut off the two criminals I was forced to call mother and father on a daily basis. Just when I had found my one chance at true family love, they ruined it. I was filled with hatred for them. I had no clue about where my birth parents had been taken or where I could even start to look for them. I also worried about what they were capable of doing for money. I knew they had kidnapped my real parents and managed to cover it up as defense. I wondered what they would be willing to do to me for the billions in the bank. This is why I tread very carefully and never let them catch on to the fact that I could not stand to be near them. Finally, my 18th birthday came around and I was granted shared access to the cash. I had already decided what my present to myself would be. I hired a private detective to do some digging and find the proof I finally needed to locate my real parents and receive justice. There must be a record of their wrongdoing somewhere. I was willing to wait it out. Revenge would be mine. A few weeks after I had paid the private detective, he asked to meet me in secret. As I walked up to his shady car, I felt nervous, but hopeful. He told me what he found. There were copies of all of the transfers of money with forged signatures, proof of phone calls to dodgy lawyers, the original copy of my grandfather's will, which left all of his money to my real mom. The detective had also found the details of a monthly payment going out to a storage facility in the next neighborhood. We were ready to take my fake mother and father down, and maybe even find my birth parents. We drove together to the police office, 
and I walked in to speak to a detective. However, as soon as I arrived, I could see mother and father. It then dawned on me that they had probably paid off a lot of police officers. I felt hopeless. What was I going to do? Then an idea came to me. What about going to the news? Surely, if people started to hear my unbelievable story, they would want to help me. Before mother and father could see me, I went running back to the private detective's car. We went racing into town to spill all of our information to the local newspaper. When we arrived at the news headquarters, we met a lovely young reporter called Sally. As we relayed everything I had found out over the years, backed up with proof, her eyes widened and her mouth fell open. She couldn't believe it, but told us we had come to the right place. She was willing to help, and I felt like crying with relief. She wrote the headline story as we sat there and let us know it would be going out to press in a few hours. She also called a news reporter friend who worked on television and asked him to come down to the station. As she repeated everything we had told her, he had the same expression of wide eyes and a gaping mouth. He was willing to help as well. Finally, I had found kind, compassionate people to help me seek justice for the family and opportunities I lost at the hands of these two psychos. I sat down for the interview with Derek, the television news reporter. As I was retelling my story, tears were tumbling out of my eyes. I finally felt a release at being heard. Everything was out in the open. The time came for the news story to be aired and the newspaper to be printed, and I felt sick. But Sally and Derek were there to hold my hand through it all. They reassured me that this was going to work, and I was so grateful. As soon as my story went live on television, the phone calls came rolling in. The reaction to my story was crazy. There was no way the police were going to be able to hide this, whether they had been paid handsomely or not. Sure enough, one of the phone calls let us know that mother and father had been arrested. I finally felt as though a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. Was this going to be the beginning of my happy ending? There was one thing left to do. The private detective and I drove downtown and found the address linked to the monthly payments from mother and father's credit card. We explained the situation to the storage facility owner, and he led us inside and down a very dark corridor to a door labeled one. As soon as he opened the door and shone the torch in, I saw two desperate faces looking up at me. My real mom and dad! I ran towards them and smothered them with kisses. They looked so pale and tired, but relieved at the sight of me. Finally, we were reunited. They explained to me how for years, Giles the butler had come to bring them food and water in the storage unit. They were never allowed out to see daylight and had lived years and years of isolated life. But finally, we were ready to be a family together. Upon mother and father's arrest, all of the money all went into my name. We sold their stiff old mansion and bought a warm family home together. I took comfort in the fact that I would never have to see them again. That is, until this morning's life.